So we've all watched Bridgerton and we all have different perspectives on kind of how we thought it came across and the things we had problems with and the things we maybe thought we did okay on. And we're gonna talk about those now. Uh, let's start by looking at what the showrunner, Chris Van Dusen kind of wanted to create with this. He says that um, he wanted to take everything that we love about period, the period genre and turn it into something fresh. Uh, and he kind of further elaborated on that saying, with Bridgerton, I wanted to escape to this lush, beautiful cinematic world, but I also wanted to explore real topics like gender and class and race and sexuality, topics that are relevant and important. And I think we've been able to do that with this show. And it's something I want to be able to do with all of my work. I wouldn't be able to be really proud of something if I wasn't saying something meaningful about the world we all live in. Do you think he said anything meaningful in this show? So I think with a lot of those topics, um, particularly race, um, he didn't delve into them deep enough. He didn't develop them enough for that to come across through the show. Um, and I think, on the other hand, with gender and feminism, they went to the other extreme where... Yeah, no, they went to the other extreme where they kind of were, um, they were really shoving it in our faces quite a lot. Yeah, they were too unsubtle. And I think that led to some issues like with the plot further down the line. Um, I think um, when I was watching the other reviews, right? One of the things that quite a few reviews seem to focus on as we're on this topic of like race and feminism and like topics that he thinks are really important. And he keeps saying that he wants to say something meaningful. Um, this show was like advertised and it's and it's been really popular because it's attracted a lot of like uh, modern audiences as well. And um, when I asked some of my um, other friends and um, friends as well, a lot of people who I wouldn't expect to be watching a period ish kind of girly romantic kind of dramas even they were watching you know not like the typical audience and I was like why are you watching this and it was kind of like well you know they've advertised this as like this like really diverse and inclusive uh, gossip girl meets like Pride and Prejudice type of um they advertised it as something really like inclusive and diverse and something fresh and modern you know and something new and um, in one of the reviews that um, I watched, they were talking a lot about race baiting, um, which is kind of, is like you advertise it to be this certain way, right? But it's only just so you can draw in people um, because, you know, you're saying, oh, we have black people, we have Asian people, we have this, and then you draw the people in. But really the matters of race and things about diversity, and especially um, during that time, Race is actually a thing in Bridgerton because they mention it in one episode with like two lines. And yeah. then after that, it's like, it just disappears completely. And I think it would have been fine to create, you know, like a cast that is so diverse, you know, um, and then it be in this like fantasy world where, you know, race actually doesn't exist. Like that is just a world that the producers were created and the writers have created on their own. But here race actually exists, but then they, they address it with just two lines, which I think was just like what, what is the point of that it was incredibly underwhelming especially because kind of racial issues in society were much more pronounced then in that period than they are now and it's already a big problem now so to kind of just brush over that like it was nothing and like oh you know we used to have it bad but now there's a kind of a racially ambiguous queen so we can become dukes or whatever and to kind of put it as some kind of something that was so easily solved. All you needed was someone racially ambiguous in a in a position of power. And then suddenly they were completely accepted into society. Mm -hmm. It's so simplistic that it's almost, I mean, it is ridiculous. It completely brushes like all the kind of layers through society at which kind of racism and stereotyping and prejudice kind of trickled, like trickles through. And yeah, it just, it didn't say anything helpful or meaningful about it. It didn't 
add to the conversations we're having today. In fact, it just retracted from them by suggesting that it's some like completely easily solvable thing that doesn't require any attention or any um, discussion. Yeah, um, I guess I initially or first want to mention that I don't think I've ever watched, I definitely haven't watched a period drama TV show before and it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've never been interested in it and when I was watching it to me I felt that it was almost just really obvious well first of all because it is um, set in this fantastical world that they place all the characters in I thought it was pretty obvious that what the producers or the creators of the show were going for were um, trying to attack and examine feminism and the power struggle and the social constraints they had and sort of focus on that and focus on that by sort of pushing everything away. And I think that's completely fine if that's your vision of your show. You don't have to address the people of color in your show. It doesn't matter because that's not your that's not the voice or that's not the creative vision you're going for. But I guess I was surprised when you guys read the quote that that was part of his vision, which really confuses me. I think that brings us on really nicely to the topic of feminism, which is the most overtly tackled in the show. And I think they did it in a really problematic way. So I think, first of all, you kind of look at Eloise, the most obviously feminist character, the kind of the voice of feminism, if you will, against the patriarchy, against forced marriage. She wants to be independent. But this feminism, her ideals, seem to come at the cost of any actual personality. I watched the show and I still have no idea what she would do with the freedom she desires. What does she care about other than just kind of removing these constraints? I thought she wanted to like sort of go to university and study um, and she I think she mentions like Byron or something so I think she's really into it she, I think she wanted to study no yeah but then like was what about the rest of her life like what does she like what does she enjoy you know it doesn't come across enough it's it almost kind of separates feminism from actual women with personalities and developed roles in society and that just seems like a weird message. And the thing is like, she's so unsubtle. She's just kind of like, they're just like, their dialogue through her is just shoving this feminist agenda like yeah. down the viewer's throats. And it's almost condescending because it almost implies like, we're not gonna understand the feminist undertones unless they're really thrown in our face again and again, which is one character, which her only purpose is to be the feminist. I think, and she I think no development beyond that. Go on, sorry. I, I think what you're saying is that she's a symbol, not a character. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Daphne, who is not a symbol of feminism, but she is a feminist character. She, you know, she doesn't just accept being told she has to marry this person for convenience. She's intelligent. She's strong. She has her own ideas about what she'd like her life to be. She knows she wants to be a mother and a wife and that's not anti-feminist, that's what she wants for her life and that's what she's gonna go after, which is about female empowerment, right? But when you're using a show to so unsubtly reinforce feminist points and points of female empowerment, and then those characters do things like become really emotionally manipulative and like weirdly rapey to their love interest, and you don't specify that that behavior is problematic, in fact, like she doesn't even barely even says sorry if I remember correctly. He says sorry and then he changes his mind and she lives happily ever after. You're almost implying to your audience that those are those actions are the actions of an empowered woman, when really they're the actions of a manipulator. Firstly, she emotionally manipulates um what's his name? Oh god, what's the guy's name? Simon. Simon, she emotionally manipulates Simon into marrying her instead of, you know, going through with the jewel. Mm -hmm. And 
that is that she kind of remembered that one person said one slightly snide thing. Even if she thought, well, it's a possibility that she knew that we were there and she saw us. She didn't present it like that to him. She didn't say someone might know. She said someone definitely knows. She was clearly grasping at straws to make him marry her because that's what she wanted even though he set his boundaries and said he didn't want marriage. She didn't care about that. She wanted what she wanted and she emotionally manipulated him into getting it. And then there's the whole having children, are we gonna have sex? You know, she learns that he's been pulling out or whatever. And he's drunk, which means he's vulnerable. And she's on top of him. And even though he's consented to have sex in a certain way, and even if he's like physically, like he's in, feeling pleasure, like physical pleasure from the act of having sex. He's made it very clear what his sexual boundaries are. He even in the moment says no several times and she doesn't respect those boundaries. She forces him to potentially father a child that he doesn't want to father. Mm -hmm. And yeah, weirdly rapey. And there's no consequences to that. That's not a strong female. That's someone who completely disregards the, the sexual boundaries of their partner. And it's, it's just, it's not, they, there's just no accountability for that. That's so problematic. And it's, it's particularly problematic when they pair it so strongly with this idea of feminism. It's just incredibly damaging because that's not what feminism is about. It's not about having power over men or having control over men. It's about having control over yourself and your own life and your wishes. So I don't know, it just really upset me that that's the one kind of social issue they chose to really tackle and they did it in that way. I just think is like immorally, like morally wrong. It's just, it's, I don't know. It really made me angry. That's extremely interesting. Because just as um, a person who just watched the show, as a character, not speaking from like more of a political standpoint, but as a character, I found Simon more troublesome and hard to find sympathy for than Daphne. Because I feel like he was the one who needed to be accountable for um, his own actions of him fully knowing the entire time that he did not want a child, but um, he's the one who initially kissed her. He's the one who um, got into marriage with her. Even though she had declared the marriage to him, he still knew that her wishes was to be a mother of children. Also, side note, his reason for not wanting children is so stupid. Because oh. he got that revenge on his dad, right? He said, oh, I'm never going to continue our line. His dad's dead. His dad died miserable knowing the line would be continued. It literally makes no difference if he has children or not now. So, like, what's... Well, I don't even understand that there, one. There, 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 there's a whole lot of problems with the show yeah. in terms of yeah. plot. What do you think, Rishma? Um, No, I just want to say, because I spoke about this with Josh before, and then he was like, how he really felt like, especially because we're on the topic of Simon, his backstory um, really, the reason I think Josh said he, he didn't have any sympathy for Simon as well, and I kind of agree, is like, um, the backstory of Simon, um, I, I felt like I didn't really care. It's not this specific thing that happened to him that I don't feel sympathy for. It's the storytelling and the way they told so the story. It's extremely hard in general for an audience to feel connected to a character or feel sympathetic towards a character. If what a script or a story does is tell sort of um, unfortunate things or things that happened to them, in flashbacks or in ways we are being told as an audience instead of us experiencing it with the character. Not just the flashbacks, but um, especially near the end of the show, Daphne sort of like tells him that she has read all the letters and 
almost explains to us what has happened to him, all the miserable things that his dad did. But that doesn't really resonate with you if you're being told that. I think it would have been a lot more effective if we saw more of the after effect of those traumas um, sort of sort of revealed in his personality, in his day-to-day -day interactions with people. Then I would feel more sympathetic if he was talking to, let's say, um, who was the other family's name? Fredericton's, the, ga the dad who was um, gambling his money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's say they were, he was with that family and talking to their dad. And all of a sudden, he has this traumatic shock where he just like needs to leave the room or something, like yeah. or like just personality things that come up would have been much more effective than telling us through words or flashbacks that feel mm -hmm. cheap. That almost feels like it was made just for us to feel sympathetic for a character who does not have much personality yeah. for himself. The only sort of like time we see kind of the duke not be the this um, duke is when he's at the boxing ring with his friend who's a bit random just has like a little side story which i don't know it was i just felt it was a bit random um there and maybe um in the gentleman's club when he sort of kind of loses it a little bit with um, um daphne's brother that's the only time we sort of let him he sort of like expressing his you know inner whatever's going on inside them other than that i don't know we don't really see much of that and even then he's expressing anger that he feels at the time that yeah. he's not it's not like a product of the trauma that he suffered like you never see that trauma in any kind of like visible or tangible like way you're yeah. told that he has the trauma but you don't see it manifest so I think that's like a really good point that Josh was having. And it comes back to, I think it comes back to the whole idea that they brush a lot of stuff under the carpet. They say they've included it and they do include it nominally to kind of meet certain quotas and to kind of potentially bring in certain audiences. Mm -hmm. But like, for, for example, like the, that's that's a whole like mental health topic that like, that kind of trauma and potential like anxiety that comes from that that they don't name, barely brush on, but they kind of insinuate it enough that you know there was potential there and they didn't take it. Yeah. I initially thought both the characters were extremely boring and vanilla. And I thought the biggest problem Wait, with- Wait, sorry, just to clarify, are we talking about Daphne and Simon? Yes. Okay. Um. And a lot of the problem with that, and I, the, a lot of the problem I had with most of the characters were that they were passive characters. Things were being done to them instead of them doing things onto the plot or the story. But I felt like as the series went on, especially in the later episodes after her marriage, Daphne became a much more active character and I was a lot more engaged into her storyline than it, like um, the episode's trial. A lot of the problem with the series, I think, is that it's trying to cram in too many plots and we don't have enough time to really um, explore those plot elements and the emotional elements. But I thought I, I liked the ideas of her um, becoming a, the wife of the duke and trying to befriend and sort of be sort of within the town and the people i like that story i liked the story where she was trying to actively help out marina that, that's her name right is yeah. it mariana yeah marina, marina yeah yeah i like, I like that, that. I, I like that she is actively using her power to Mm -hmm. she, she she has agency she is she is an active character in the storyline so I thought she became a much more in interesting character as the season went on 
in terms of their relationship, I had no investment in their relationship. And I think it's just extremely poor story writing, uh, storytelling, just bad script, bad storytelling. The biggest point I guess I want to make, because there's, I feel like there's a lot of problems, but the biggest point I want to make is that the reason why we're not invested or I'm not invested is because we don't have any reason or we, we don't see any interactions of them of why their chemistry works, what they like about each other, why they like hanging out with each other. And this is not just a Daphne and Simon problem. I think there's a problem that exists among all the couples where all the scenes between the couples are either crying, arguing, or having sex. And there's not a there's not a single moment where any of the couples hang out and we get to see their chemistry. We get to see what they like about each other. We get to see what their casual conversations are like because they're constantly in balls, parties, or in their bedrooms. What about, what about like the... Sorry, right, go on. Just um, one to ask, what about like the conversations with Daphne and Simon? Quite a lot of the time, you know, they would go walking with their like moms behind them, mom and the aunt behind them. You know, mm -hmm. there were a lot of ca casual conversations there with Simon and Daphne and then... No. No? It, it, a, a lot of their conversations to my, to the degree that I remember it, were about the pot, mm. about the ruse. It yeah. wasn't about yeah. them. And what about a lot, a, a lot of it is trying to move the plot forward, but it's it's not interesting to follow that plot because they have not spent the time to for us to emotionally connect to the characters. Yeah, I think it's really interesting for me hearing you say that because I knew that I wasn't that invested. I didn't really care about them, but I hadn't kind of put into words why and what you said makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. there there was just, there were just no moments that like really touched you where I thought oh that's you know that's a, like a really lovely moment between those two people or that's a really kind of interesting dynamic that those two people have Lady Danbury, I thought, was such an interesting character in, for the for the period that we're talking about. You know, she's a woman who's uh, well black, and then she's um, uh, unmarried. No, no, she's a widow, right? Um, anyway, she doesn't have a husband. That's the point. And she's rich. She's friends with the queen, and she kind of just like doesn't take shit from anyone. Like you know. I thought her, it's like it's characters like that that are more interesting than say like the lead like Daphne and stuff and I and I and I wish we'd seen more of that rather than just like really loose plots here and there here and there and like weird duels which made absolutely no sense to me really even the queen herself I mean she yeah. obviously had the power the king was kind of this mentally ill weak man who was not with it anymore and although kind of he still had like the power nominally. She was the one really making the wheels turn in the monarchy. She was the one who supposedly kind of made it okay for black people to become dukes and, mm -hmm. you know, have their status in society. Like imagine but, if we'd explored that more. I think that would have yeah. made for some- I mean, this is the thing, yeah. like they had a woman who was doing all these things supposedly. And what do we see her talk about? A gossip magazine. That's all she talks about. And you think, how can a woman who's making these extraordinary changes in society about the, with the status of women and black people and you know basically leading a country how is like that her main interest i mean come like it's just it's just a bit like soul crushing <laughs> it's like how can they do that to us <laughs> how can they do that to her basically mm -hmm. just, i don't know I think it would have been interesting to see 
someone like Lady... What's her Danbury. name? Danbury. Danbury, yes. Explored a bit further, like you said, but also because she is such an empowered character, I would have liked to have seen a scene or a story plot where she does get ignored or abused by a certain group of people. And she is a lot more vulnerable in that situation where you you have never expected her to be vulnerable until that scene in the, in the series where she, you connect with her more and really understand what she has to deal with. Like, I think it would have been really interesting to see someone of such power and such self-confidence sort of like where you see her helpless in a social structure where she is ignored or where she can't get e everything done because she is a black woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, yeah. One thing I did want to ask you guys is about Marina's character. What do you guys thought? Um, because her character is so almost a bit detached from the storyline a little bit from, you know, it's like she's just a bit on the side. Yeah. you know um and then her end conclusion like she actually ends up getting married off to her lover's brother so wh what did you guys think of uh marina's storyline or her character overall well the twist confused me because if i were in her position and i had a soldier boyfriend who was off fighting a war and he stopped responding like out of nowhere I think I'd start thinking pretty quickly that he might be dead or injured. So the fact that she just automatically thought this man she's in love with, she just thought, well, he was just using me then and he doesn't care about me or the baby. Um, but, but he only stopped responding her mind that he's dead. Yeah. But he only stopped responding after her letter saying she's pregnant because before that he was responding. Yeah, I know, but even like if he just like stopped responding out of nowhere, even if it was suspicious timing, I think I'd at least consider the possibility that he might be harmed, not just jump straight into the conclusion that he's a horrible person then. Is it sexist for me to say she might not have been in the clearest of minds because she was dealing with a lot and she was also emotional with her pregnancy? I don't think so. I don't think that's sexist. Okay. Mm -hmm. what do you think how do you feel about that no no i don't think it's a sexist thing but and uh, to some degree you might even be right like because she was so um sort of like you know when she found out she was pregnant right is like especially at that time where she's like oh shit like i think that really messes with you a little bit because she kind of feels like <gasps> a little bit like in the in the deep end you know, and not knowing what to do. And the only person that she knows can actually rescue her is not responding, you know? And, and how old are these characters supposed to be? Are they like 16, 17? They're, I think they're like 15, 16, if they're coming out. And probably 16. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, thought that they're, they're I think I checked. Um, I think it's like 17, 18. That's yeah. not when girls came out though. Really? At the time, no. Maybe like, that's that another, like, modernized time, right? It's not her first time. It's, it is her first time coming out. She hasn't been on the scene before. She would have been about 16. Mm. Mm. And Eloise, who's just a bit too young, would have been maybe 14, 15. Daphne Bridgerton is 21 when she makes a debut in British society. Yeah, mm. they, that's... Yeah. That's an old woman. Accurate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She would have been considered like basically nearly like desperate by that point. Yeah. Like like 35 <laughs> now. <laughs> no, more like I'm pretty sure more like like 39 now, 40. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's interesting, isn't it? I did think they were younger. Not 15, but I did think they were like younger. Um, I wanted to talk about the older brother a little bit, right? Um, but I wanted to know you guys have thought because I found this character a little bit confusing like and I didn't understand for example why you're going the older brother is Sienna's love interest yeah 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 Anthony, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And then, um, the man of the house 
Uh-huh. Man of the house. Yeah, man of the house. Man, yeah. Um, and then you know, like, um, so around the beginning where he was so um hesitant to get Daphne to marry any, like he was, he kept putting all the suitors off, but then he was ready to get her married off to this creep, that creepy guy. And then what's it called? Then all of a sudden there was this thing of like, okay, we're gonna have a duel. We're gonna get ready to kill each other. And then, like, well, I, I don't, I don't really. Here's the thing, and I, I really like Austin. I also, I mean, I like reading old like books from mm-hmm. that era. I like watching series and films from that era, and his kind of mindset especially from the point of view of this basically i mean probably still a teenager maybe early 20s i don't mm-hmm. know how old he is but basically young guy who's trying to figure out his own life but also has the responsibility of this entire family that he didn't sire they're not his children you know mm-hmm. he didn't choose to have that responsibility but it's thrust upon him because of his position in society and he's trying to figure out the right thing all of his decisions and is twisting and turning as he kind of navigates those kind of decisions that will affect the entire lives of all these people he's suddenly responsible for. They made sense to me based on how people thought at the time. I think the problem was that his his plot, his storyline didn't get the time it needed for his like his the, the way his mind kind of changed and like kind of went back and forth to actually like develop in a way that people understand like oh I see how he's changed his mind now. He didn't get that time or attention. But I think if he had that time, you would have seen like, he's first of all, he's thinking like a a brother, you know, like no one's good enough for her, you know. And then his mom's like, no, you need to think like a father. You need to think like someone who's responsible for the rest of her life. And her life is going to be much better if she's married to someone who can take care of her. And then he kind of, in this panic, thinks, okay, I'm going to get the first person I can because I've been... I've been scaring them away and that was wrong and I realized that was wrong now so I just need to get someone for her because I don't want her to be stuck alone and then he gets that like random creepy guy Mm -hmm. I totally see the evolution there but I just think for a a modern audience who may not be as interested in period dramas or like literature from that era which is a big part of the audience because that's what they're trying to attract with all these like with the race baiting and the queer baiting and things other people who j- wouldn't normally click on it anyway you know i i can see why that wouldn't come across to that whole part of the audience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i i think the pattern we're noticing here is that there's just too many characters and too many plot points for such a short episode episodic series see they it- needed a lot more time where because even daphne and simon's um, relationship their core of attraction I understand they are attracted to each other because they don't like the properness or the phoniness or the facade that people put up to marry for wealth marry for status um, that's why they're attracted to each other because they actually believe in love and passion but like I said before, we're not given any time to explore that where they're um, just interacting with each other casually. Mm. I thought another problem that relates to the length or the lack thereof in the show was the resolution of conflicts. I found it extremely odd and sort of confusing in a lot of scenes where two characters were in conflict pretty big conflicts and the next time they meet um they 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 will barely address it or they were completely fine with um a lot of that happened with um simon and daphne's brother Mm -hmm. a lot of that also happened with miss featherington and marina where they are constantly working behind their back to accomplish everything in their own interest. But the scene after the argument or conflicts, 
they would be completely fine just talking like nothing had happened. Even the conflict resolution of Simon and his dad was sort of up in the air. I had no idea why Simon changed his mind. Mm. What caused him to change his mind to have a baby? Mm. That's, um, so from our sort of conversations, we're saying we needed more time, right? But the one of the reviews that I was um, looking at, and which kind of I agreed with at the beginning when I was watching it, I think I was like halfway through as well. Um, they said it would have been a really good movie, a really good like rom com -y type of movie. They didn't need eight episodes. And like, there's way too many characters that. for that. Sorry? There's way too many characters for it to be. Um, well, movie. they wouldn't have all these like little um, plots. Like, for example, like the Featherington father, like, he had his own sort of like story yeah. going on. Yeah. Like, there was just so many unnecessary things. And, um, um, the same sort of review was also talking about, you know, ultimately, you know how Daphne's trying to figure out what sex is and how uh, well, all the females are trying to figure out, like, what is this? How do you make a baby? Like, we get it, you know, that they're trying to figure out. They have that, but they keep going over it again and again. They have sort of like Penelope and Eloise talking about it. Then there's um, sort of like um, Simon and Daphne talking about it. And then there's Eloise asking the whole family, in front of the whole family, how does this happen? Then there's her mom trying to explain it. When really, ultimately, she just has to go to um, the, the maid and then ask her, you know, it's like, there's just so many things that could have been cut down, reduced, and it would have made a nice romantic film, is what they said. Um, and I think um, that's why I'm, I'm kind of excited about the musical. Like, I think they can do this musical really well. What do you think? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's like you said, either they cut out a lot and make a film, or they keep what they've got and make it longer. Like they're in this weird middle gap where mm -hmm. it yeah. just hasn't worked the way they wanted it to. Yeah, yeah. because even the Mr. Fredding, Fredrington, Featherington yeah. yeah. storyline, I understand what it was. And I really liked at the end of the final episode where Mrs. Featherington is devastated and she happens to come across Marino and they have this conversation. I love the conversation where she, Marina asks her, how could you be in a marriage for two decades without love? Mm -hmm. And it's, this is sort of like the moment where sort of like the older people pass on the knowledge down to the really, really relatively young main characters that we have in the show where she basically says, in a marriage you sort of like learn to pick up on things that you love about them. You might not have the passion that you originally had, or you might have conflicts like he did with gambling, but you pick up on things as you live together as a companion. And I thought that was really sweet. And those things could have been expanded more if it was a longer series, or like you said, it could have been completely done away with, done away with in, in a more compact movie. Yeah, I thought that was a great scene as well, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I get why he was there, because he was there to show what happens to women with a man in charge who shouldn't necessarily be in charge, who isn't the most responsible, who isn't the most um, practical or intelligent or strong. And I think in the next season, what we're going to see is how that family fares under matriarchy, which is the mother who's left, who always was the strongest one and the most ambitious. And I think that he was there to provide that kind of um, comparison. Mm. But again, it was, it was, it was not, um, I guess, yeah, it, it wasn't developed enough. I think they're either like way too obvious to the yeah. point of like ruining their own message or like really underdeveloped to the point that it doesn't translate through just like someone watching it, you know, for fun without yeah. thinking about analyzing it.
guess um because we're talking about the family this leads us on to penelope and i guess the sort of whole reveal of um lady whistledown so did you guys know this was going to be her no no you, you you predicted it right rush there were times when um eloise was talking to um penelope about lady whistledown and every time lady whistledown's name came up she was <laughs> like mm, yeah mm, yeah and then i was like why 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 didn't eloise like suspect her you know when she was suspecting everyone but then i really agree with sylvie's points which uh, uh, i guess because we've talked about this do you want to just yeah. say? so the reason i never expected penelope is the same reason that i thought it was such a bullshit twist ending like it was completely like the prize factor and it makes no sense for her character like none at all firstly Lady Whistledown is writing a magazine that's published in this very coy, kind of wise kind of tone where she insinuates a lot and kind of talks a lot about kind of experience and about the kind of the coming out, um, the coming out experience and all that. Penelope has only just come out. So she's learning the process as she's going along. She doesn't have any kind of like, she doesn't have an, like an older sister who kind of tells her or an older friend even that we ever see who tells her about these things she doesn't know what sex is or understand how it works so I don't know how she's coming across so coy um and also it's she when she reveals uh that Marina's pregnant at the end someone in her position that is an incredibly callous cold thing to do specifically for her I and it's because she knows that in revealing it publicly, she's ruining potentially her own chances of marriage and stability. She's ruining the chances of her sisters who have nothing to do with it. She's clearly ruining Marina's chance and thus probably causing the Marina's baby to grow up poor, um, weak, in a very vulnerable position with nothing and no kind of stability at all and also shaming the man she supposedly loves, when she could easily have just told him in private. And when you do see her attempt to tell him in private, she can't even say the word pregnant out loud. You know, she's tiptoeing around it, and yet she's prepared to publish it publicly. That is so, I mean, you just don't, that's so cold and horrifyingly just- I don't- Unaccountable for her, like for any kind of, go on. I think it makes sense. Um, not uh, the thing I can't make sense of is I don't think it's ever been established in the show that she is well read and well written. Oh, really? I thought, I thought it was. Was it? Uh, you know what? I can't remember. I'm not sure. Anyway, I think the act of her publishing things and expanding and exaggerating um, rumors around the town. I think it's, I think it is um, sort of aligns with her character because her character is basically, she's extremely naive and childish. She has really childish behavior. She does things on instinct and how she feels at the moment without thinking much of the consequence. She is basically, through her letters, um, tattletailing to everyone in the town. That's her sort of release, I guess. And I think it makes sense as someone who's one of the youngest characters on the show, who also acts really childish as Penelope to Marina of her jealousy. And even when she befriends Marina, she's so naive. It's almost very childlike. She doesn't really take into consideration what her mother fears. And that's sort of like the positive or the benefit of a childlike logic of everyone is equal. I just like this person. I want to hang out with them. But also as a child, when you're a child, when you sort of get things taken away from you, you immediately leave. 
immediately feel jealous and act upon those feelings immediately. So I thought it was sort of in character, but I, it was hard for me to believe that she was actually writing the letters and arranging all these to give it to the newspapers and doing it so yeah. discreetly. And also just, I don't know, I think from the very basically first episode, Lady Whistledown is constantly insinuating, you know, don't get caught doing anything too scandalous. It can be life ruining. She touches on that a lot. And then the fact that she completely, so she's obviously very aware of how easy it is to destroy your reputation. And once your reputation is destroyed, you know, well, life can really turn to shit. Like a really, <laughs> especially as a woman, mm. you really have almost no power at all at that time. And so the fact that she would kind of feel okay or like because it's she does it's not like she's just like tweeting it and then it's like instantaneous she has to write it out then she has to travel to the publishers then she has to go to the publishers receive money you know she has all this time where she hasn't thought wait this is like five lives I'm potentially ruining in a really permanent way and somehow she's okay with it just because she's jealous about a boy when she could so easily just tell him face to face and not put all those people like in danger like that. It just, you never see her being that cruel or that cold in any other kind of context. If you'd, if you'd seen little like kind of clips of her being like kind of very rude to the servants or, you know, having these little kind of moments where she's cruel, then it might be believable because she doesn't have any outward cruelty throughout the whole series is just too much of a twist for me to for me to find that believable. If I had like a sentence to review the thoughts of my thoughts about this TV show, it would be that it's extremely Netflix. What they do is put a lot of pretty good looking people together in a good looking show, um, have some claimed bold social commentary but not really and then have some modern songs in it and some modern twist to it that doesn't really get um anything accomplished mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it's just i think if i could describe it in one word it should be underwhelming <laughs> <laughs> Um, just because you said um, the modern music, um, when I asked people what they thought of um, Bridgerton, uh, a few people actually mentioned the music. Some saying they liked it, but there were quite a few actually who say, said that they found it kind of distracting. And I know you have your opinions about that, Josh. Do you want to say? For me, it's not just the music. It's about the whole modernizing of the show. Um, but comes across really blatantly in the music. Um, mm -hmm. What Even just like the what? violins, mm -hmm. like the rendition of Ariana Grande, it, was just, mm -hmm. it took me out of that world for a bit. I was kind of in the world and then I thought, oh, Ariana Grande, and it, like, it kind of detracted for me that kind of, the, how immersive the show could be. To me, it was unveiling sort of what I just said about it's very Netflix. It's very, it's a business oriented mindset. It's not a creative product um, because it, the modern music adds nothing to the show or the plot or the characters. It does nothing for it. What it does is have more f people filter in to watch the show, to look at the pretty people and the, and the pretty dresses and the pretty sets and the backgrounds and have songs that they recognize. Because people, um, simple-minded people, <laughs> when they, <laughs> when they hear, when they hear or see something they recognize, they immediately have a fondness and immediately clouds over their, um, um, judgment. Yeah. And they tend to associate or have an appreciation or like that product more because they recognize it. Yeah. And that, your your comments about the costume 
just reminded me of one of my biggest pet peeves of the series, which was oh. that like putting anachronisms aside, which I don't usually like to do, but you know, it's not the biggest deal if they're not completely 100% period accurate. Mm -hmm. But the fact that like this costume designer, Ellen Mirochnik, I think she's called, yeah was kind of talking about how they couldn't hire costumes because they had such specific visions in mind and everything was bespoke and handmade and completely tailored to the Bridgerton vision. And they did have beautiful costumes, apart from the one girl who was curvier or more overweight, who week after week, like episode after episode, consistently had these really badly fitting dresses. Why? I mean, it did nothing. Like, everyone else had these like very tailored, well-fitting dresses. Why was she kind of like left? Like they didn't even cover her boobs, like the like top of the dress. It was just like half in the middle. I just don't understand why they didn't do that better. I guess this is a really good segue for um, talking about the sexuality of the show. Yeah, I was gonna say. Um, do you have Do you have any thoughts on it, Rush? Um, well, what's it called? One of the things I wanted to ask you guys was, um, in basically every single interview where, um, with the cast, they talk about the female gaze. And I didn't, I didn't really understand because when I watched it, right, yes, there were a lot of sex scenes and, you know, like the really intimate moments. Some of it was nice, sometimes a bit excessive, you know. But episode six, so the episode where, you know, um, they're, they're married now and they're like... Um, yeah, honeymoon face. Yeah, that was um, directed by um, a female director. I don't know the exact name, but I might put it down. Um, and they had like an, uh, an intimacy coach as well. And they really... And um, the, uh, Daphne and um, what's it called? The, Simon. Simon. So they were talking about um, what's it called? how that was really helpful for them and they made them feel safe and so on. But they had this particular focus, even the producer said that, on like making sure that all the sex scenes were done through the female gaze. Meaning that the, and this is like, um, I'm just paraphrasing what he was saying. It was like, he said he wanted each sex scene to move the story along in some way and for it to be from the female perspective and and for for Daphne I can kind of see it where um you know with like every little thing you see her like learning a bit more about sex or like you know a little kiss and then she learns to touch herself and then then you see her you know first being really shy with Simon and then you know later she rapes him and um basically all of that uh, it's like you see her development of like um sexually yeah. growing and developing that but other than that I was like what I thought it was just like all the other sex scenes I've seen in other things right yeah Am I mean I, I, I definitely didn't pick up on any female gaze um I don't know maybe that's just my asexual, my asexual nature coming through that I, I for me it, it was just like pretty uncomfortable to watch and I didn't get any enjoyment out of it. I thought there were definitely way too many sex scenes. I thought at least half of them didn't drive the plot forward. Mm. Yeah. Um, Josh, how do you feel like in terms of that kind of hearing that it's supposed to be sex from a female point of view, did you feel like it was different from your own or like, did you notice any difference at all? Just um, uh -huh. before you say, um, just to insert, um, this was, um, they said it was um, the reviewers that I watched. They said they they really felt the female gaze, and this was the reason why. They said it was so different and refreshing. They said because it wasn't just like all the other sex scenes where a guy just kind of like comes, does his thing, and is like you know. It was more about you know um, making Daphne feel really. It it was like really intimate sex and the kind of sex that women want, not the kind of sex that's done through a male gaze, which is kind of like. I was like, what? I, I didn't, I, for me, they did not feel different from like any other sex scene in any other film, like ever. Really? Okay, what about May you? Maybe like old movies, like maybe like 70s or 80s where it was rough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, 
But no, I don't think it's necessarily any different from modern movies unless the movie demands that the man is more aggressive. If yeah. the scene is if the scene is a scene where they are both in love, I don't see how this is any different from anything else. So, I guess um a big question would be do you guys see the hype around Bridgerton because it's got a lot of hype like a lot yeah. of people are watching it and it's very very popular. You know? Mm -hmm. So do you yeah. see the hype? They've marketed it. They've marketed it. They've marketed it so precisely. They've ticked all these boxes. They've really really done everything they could to kind of like get their little claws into as big an audience as possible. And because that's so calculated, of course there's like a lot of hype around it because they've generated that. They've very specifically done things to generate that. Mm -hmm. I I and I also I think a lot of people watch a show like Bridgerton and they're not thinking critically while they watch it. They're just thinking, oh, is it making me laugh? Is it, you know, relatively easy to understand? Mm -hmm. And if it takes those boxes of like very passive general entertainment, they're basically happy. But I don't watch it like that. Um I know but you seem to rush me. I mean, I know that like, I was talking about how problematic it was to you before you'd watched it. And you said when you watched it, you're like, oh I thought it was fine. Like, yeah, really but I watched it really passively, you know, I didn't watch it with the intention of this is going to be some groundbreaking thing of like, or something that I really should be paying attention to. Yeah. I watched it thinking it was just going to be like some like, you know, really like romantic, nice story. So and it was only later when I actually sat down and thought, okay, what, like, what did I just watch? You know, that I realized, okay, well, there's this problem here, there's this problem here. But as a passive watch, you know, it was enjoyable. Yeah. I thought it was funny and lighthearted in moments. Mm -hmm. It definitely like you could watch it and just relax. You yeah. Could just watch it passively decide you weren't going to care about the different issues and and have a bit of a laugh. Mm -hmm. So it yeah, I mean it's all right in terms of that, but yeah, definitely didn't live up to what it was hoping to achieve, which is some kind of I don't know like important discourse and social issues of today and <laughs> yeah. um uh, when i first actually my friend told me to watch it and i put put the episode on and then i i turned it off after 5 minutes it was only later after you told me to watch it again i was like okay let me give this a proper go because you told me like you know to watch it and see what i thought um because you raised some interesting points and then i kind of like forced myself through that first episode a little bit and then but i only did it like when i was like really tired and i was like oh i want to fall asleep but i want to like just put something on in the background to fall asleep to and i and i really enjoyed it when when it when it was something like that but uh, i i agree with you i don't think it's anything like big political discourse on the, all the major mm. issues and and, it's, and i don't really think it's saying all these really big meaningful things but it yeah. was a nice that's why i thought it'd be a really nice rom-com film Because I, as I could see it going in into that category, you know, but then yes, it could also go the other way where if they really take the time to, you know, go into all the characters in much more, I guess, detail. So, yeah. I, I quite it could have done been done better, like most of the things on the show. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been a lot more subtle, but I really enjoyed the idea of. the female characters being completely clueless to sex and yeah. being more open about sexuality like those different conversations that Penelope and Eloise had were not only funny but i thought they were really interesting as well mm. that barely any movies or any shows today really address where one side of a couple or like specifically an entire female generation has no idea how, what sex is and how it works i thought that could have been really interesting to mm -hmm. like see them grow and why understand why what think, it is why do you think the mother you know when um daphne actually asks on her marriage day like mm -hmm. you got to tell me what to what to do basically why why does the mother struggle so much do you think to like explain I think because historically women were taught to be 
ashamed of sex. Um, sex was something that you did like for your husband in a marriage bed and to create children. But sex wasn't supposed to be a pleasurable act for women. You weren't supposed to do it for fun. And there's, there was so much shame. I mean, women didn't even used to really tell their daughters about periods, you know, and until relatively recently. And kind of girls would just like have like a load of blood like one day and be terrified. And then their mother would just like hand them like a product or whatever and say, use it. And they, but it was never explained. Those kind of discussions just weren't had in that time. Um, and because, you know, obviously, because because women's life could be ruined if they became pregnant outside of marriage. They, one way, the main way they detracted, they tried to stop that from happening was to create all this shame around the idea of sex, especially for women. Mm -hmm. And so I can easily imagine her mother really not wanting to have that incredibly awkward chat with her daughter. And on top of that, having been taught her whole life that it's something shameful and something, you know, um, that it's just a duty that she has to kind of get through. Mm. I don't know, that made sense to me. One thing I did respect about the plot and the ending is that, um, what was the name of? Sienna. Like older brother's prostitute girlfriend? Sienna. Sienna. The fact that Sienna did not end up with, what's he, Anthony? Yeah, yeah. Sienna did not end up with Anthony. Um, and this is actually something that they did quite well in terms of writing kind of feminist characters. Sienna and the dressmaker. What's the dressmaker mm -hmm. name? I can't remember any of them now. There's um, way too Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, we know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are great examples of women who are kind of deciding their own fate, kind of making their own priorities and living by them, um, getting by in a world that's pretty hard to get by in. And I think that's the direction that Bridgerton should have gone in because they've I've chosen to do a period piece, right? And women of that time didn't have the same language or concepts around feminism that we do now. Those things didn't exist, but that doesn't mean that strong independent women didn't exist. So rather than putting this kind of artificial dialogue in place where it's kind of like, oh, screw the patriarchy or whatever, all women should be independent. Those ideas were too radical for that time. And that's why they don't feel, they feel artificial because they're so anachronistic. But showing women like that, instead of having women tell you kind of what feminism is, is the way that those kind of period pieces should really mm. advocate for those kind of ideals. It just, it's much more natural it makes much more sense in the time period and it's much more meaningful because you see a real person you connect with as opposed to just a prop kind of for these ideas that you're already familiar with anyway. Um, and I, I think they actually did that pretty well with those two female characters. But the problem is all the main female characters didn't have that same depth. So... I mean, it's just, again, a wasted opportunity. Would you watch season two then, that is the question. Yeah, because <laughs> I want to see, because they've had so much feedback, like the kind of things we're saying, I'd want to see how they take that and if they learn from it. If season two had like exactly the same problems that we've talked about like just now, then I wouldn't give season three a try. I'd um, give up. It. I probably wouldn't even finish season two. But if I can see from the get-go that they've actually taken all this on board and they've adapted how they tell their story, then yeah, I would be interested in carrying on watching. Oh, what about you, Josh? Because we had to force Josh to watch. Yeah, well, well, Josh is like the only one here who's like definitely not the target audience. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say no, only because I'm not invested. Mm. in the characters or the plot okay um yeah uh i would like to see what they do next just i just want to see like where they're gonna take it next you know um i don't think it would be that interesting if they sort of like did the same thing they did with daphne but with another sister i don't know like i hope they don't go down that way 
you know? I think they might focus on a brother next just to give it a little bit of a... A little bit of a twist. Mm. I don't know, that's, that's my prediction. So there's a lot of hype um, regarding Bridgerton the musical where um, two people, Abigail and I think Emily, um, they created like a TikTok of, um, uh, they just created songs, they're composers, I think, and musicians. Um, and it's just been, people are just duetting it on TikTok. They're singing it. I am addicted to that burn song. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like literally, I'm just going to burn. It, it's so good. And so I think I'd be so excited to, um, watch this musical because actually not so much because of like the storyline and whatnot but I think just the songs that they've made like it's I really I I really really like it and I think because I was kind of leaning into this idea of like the short film so you know short film with musical that's basically Bollywood and I love Bollywood and I love musicals so I think I think it'd be something that I'd be really excited to watch, but not as something like we said, as it being like a political message or, you know, trying to tackle some big issues, but as something fun, enjoyable, rom-com, romance, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So I'd be pretty excited for that. And I think it would be really popular as well. Um, it'd be, I would love it. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they'd still use that sort of modern fuse of music you know, a bit of Ariana Grande too in the background. I don't know if they would do that, but- I'm um, sure they would. You'd think they would. Um, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I think you should check them out. I think I really like their songs. I'd be very excited for that. Mm -hmm.